In this video, we're gonna talk about a lumbar epidural steroid injection in lumbar fluoroscopic anatomy. Anytime you use a fluoroscope, there's use of radiation, so you have to talk about radiation safety, so. Good much better. Let's talk about the equipment. Common radiation safety equipment includes a thyroid shield, lead apron, radiation attenuating gloves, hat, and glasses. First things first, you need a mayo stand with a sterile drape, a chloroprep, a drape, a 25 gauge one and a half inch needle with local anesthetic, a two needle, loss of resistance syringes. We have plastic, glass, and a 3cc syringe, which we sometimes use the contrast. Contrast in a glucocorticoid for injection, plus or minus saline. All right, last but not least is the C-arm or fluoro or fluoroscopy as we commonly refer to it in the clinic. Um, it's an x-ray machine. It has the image source from the bottom, so the x-ray shooting up from the bottom and the image intensifier at the top. Our patient is in the prone position, so we have the lower back or the lumbar spine right here, and so we can go ahead and get started. We would be using sterile gloves for this procedure. However, given this is a demonstration, I'm just using the nitro gloves we have in clinic. We clean off the patient and then apply our drape. We'll now take an AP image of the lumbar spine. So AP, anterior, posterior. Anterior, the image source is coming anterior to the patient, the front of the patient. Posterior, the image intensifier is capturing that x-ray image. Okay, you have an AP image you're pretty content with of the lumbar spine. Now let's talk about the, some of the fluoroscopic anatomy before we get into what I call the CPAP of an epidural. So you have, uh, this is a bit of a stretch, but three creatures that live in the lumbar spine. The first is an owl. So first you have these circle-like big owl eyes, which represent the pedicles of the vertebral body. Then you have this linear nose that comes down which represents the spinous process. Then you have these wing-like flappy projections, which are the, the, the wings of the owl or the transverse processes of the vertebral body. It's a little bit easier to see on a three-dimensional model. So if you were to cut everything back from here backwards, this is namely the posterior arch of the vertebral body, or, or the vertebrae rather, then you'd be left with just two circles, basically. And that's because you'd be cutting these cylindrical-like structures of the pedicle off, and then you'd be looking at it like this. Much the same way is with the spinous process. So if you were to be looking at like a pencil, for instance, on, the, on a profile view, it would look like a long linear structure. However, if you were to look at it just from the eraser, it would look like just a dot. So if you look at this from a profile view or a lateral view, it looks like this knife-like projection. But if you turn it, it's more of a linear beak-like shape. And then these transverse processes on the sides, they're very radiolucent oftentimes uh, when you're doing these procedures. You can see them pretty well on our x-ray here and then obviously on our three-dimensional model too. All right, next up is the butterfly of the lumbar spine. So you can see that pretty dang well here. So I'm tracing out the butterfly right now and then we'll go over the components of it. So right here, we have the superior articulating process, basically on both sides here, inferior articulating process, both sides here, the pars intraarticularis right here on both sides, and then the lamina right here, both sides. It's again easier to see on a three-dimensional model. You have the superior articulating process that articulates with the inferior articulating process of the vertebra above, and the same on this side. So this is the inferior articulating process right here that articulates with the superior articulating process from the vertebrae below. Together, they're called the zygoapophyseal joint or Z-joint or facet joint. And then you have the lamina. So it basically forms the roof of your uh, spinal canal or your vertebral foramen right here. And then the pars articularis is this area right on both sides, which bears a lot of clinical significance. The third creature is the Scotty dog, which is best seen in an oblique image and has been covered a lot on the internet. So let's move on to count as part of the CPAP mnemonic. Count. So it's important to know where you are in the lumbar spine because of lumbosacral transitional anatomy. So we'll, we'll count from cephalad to caudal, so from head to toe. And the easiest way of doing that typically is using your 12th rib. And you can see the structure here. And we'll go ahead and just assume that this is going to be our 12th rib here. 
can really highlight that. So um, if that is T12, and sometimes you can have hypoplastic ribs or non-existent ribs at T12 or really big um, transverse process or basically rib bearing lumbar vertebrae too, but we'll kind of ignore that. So we're just going to say this is L1, L2, L3, L4, and we've placed our 2 e needle down on the patient. And so now we know landmark-wise that our 2 e needle should be around the L4 vertebrae level. So I'll move down further, um, uh, caudal, so moving the C-arm towards the feet to continue with our count. And we'll just go ahead and assume then below this is going to be our L5 vertebrae. And so now we'll slide the C-arm lower down on the lumbar spine towards the direction of the feet. And now we know that this is L3 and we left our 2E needle on top of L4. So this is L4 and I'm drawing out these vertebral bodies and you can notice in the lumbar spine, the vertebral bodies are sort of hourglass shaped. And then this therefore is L5. Yeah, well, kind of missed this, but L5 here. Next, we'll look at the interlaminar space. I'm outlining it right here. So fortunately, our patient doesn't have a lot of osteophytes or any sort of uh, covering of this area such that we won't be able to get in. But if they did, sometimes a caudal or a cephalad tilt of the C-arm can help open up this space, okay? So next in the CPAP, we'll move on to position. So our position is going to be left perimedian L4, L5, so left perimedian L4, L5 epidural steroid injection right here. We've marked radiographically where we are on the AP image on the vertebral level using fluoro and with landmarks using the TUI needle. We'll now identify exactly where we want to enter into the interlaminar space. All right, we've made it to the placement section for epidural steroid injection. So this is the interlaminar space that we're going to proceed to place our needle in. This is our TUI needle. And so this is placement for a needle. So there's excellent universal terminology that the field of pain medicine is moving towards. There's a paper by Dr. Jintender Gill that's published in Interventional Pain Medicine that I'll link in the description of this, but it's kind of outside the, the scope of this video. But suffice it to say that we're not going to go too far lateral in the interlaminar space, and we're not going to go right in the middle because we want a more targeted therapy. So we're going to go sort of in between that area. We've marked radiographically where we want to enter into the interlaminar space, now at 4 or 5 left paramediate. Prior to doing so, we'll anesthetize the skin with 0.5% lidocaine, about 1 to 2 cc's. We will then insert the TUI needle until you get quote unquote kerchus such that the two needle no longer flops around. All right, we're still in the placement section in CPAP for an epidural steroid injection. We've got our two needle here, and essentially it's in a coaxial view. And so what that means is it's in line with the x-rays. So if you were to, you know, place a pencil like this and look at it from its side, it would look like this. But if you look straight down, the eraser, it would just look like a dot. And that's what we've done for the TUI needle and the x-ray beams. Our position was L4, L5, left paramedian. And now, you know, we decided on our placement, where exactly on that left side that we're going. And we decided it wouldn't be too far lateral and it wouldn't be right in the midline. And one thing I wanted to note is that sometimes when you're doing injections, you'll notice the pedicle right here and the pedicle right here and the spinous process right here. Don't get confused about how the spinous process is lower down than the pedicles. It still belongs to those pedicles. And you can see the lamina coming and making this V shape. And so this, you know, belongs to L3 up here. And this belongs, you know, to L4. Our next step is obtaining a contralateral oblique view. So CLO for short. Our injection is going on the left side and we have obliqued 45 degrees to the right. We'll take an image here and see our L4, L5 interlaminar injection. Okay, we've made it to A, the approximation point of CPAP. So this is a contralateral oblique view, otherwise known as a CLO view, and it's used to assess the depth of a needle, whereas the AP view is used to more so understand the medial lateral or superior inferior positioning of our needle, or kind of like our X or and Y coordinates. 
The AP is also sometimes referred to as a trajectory view. And switching to a CLO view is not as simple as merely going to 45 degrees or bleaking a senior arm in the opposite direction of your needle or opposite side of your needle, since there's a lot of variability in individuals' anatomy. So a true CLO view is the angle by which a line parallel to the lamina intersects the middle sagittal plane of an individual. So even ideally on this image, these are the lamina. And then this would, and these could be crispened up, the lamina that I just drew over. But this line that I'm drawing here is the ventral interlaminar line, the V-I-L-L. -L. And the ventral interlaminar line is basically the line and the theoretical line that approximates the margin, the ventral margin of the lamina. So our needle is pretty far advanced already, but this view is used for advancing the needle. So typically our needle would be further out here, and we'd be using this image to understand how far we need to advance our needle to get close to or approximate the ventral interlaminar line. So we'll advance just until we're nearby the ventral interlaminar line. Okay, so this is essentially the exact same photo, and I'll outline the lamina here like I had prior. And so obviously we're very close to the ventral interlaminar line. But the point of this photo is to remind you that you should be taking intermittent fluoroscopic photos as you're advancing to make sure that you haven't gone too far. And if you notice any change in resistance with your needle, you should make sure to take a fluoroscopic photo and or switch to the loss of resistance syringe because prior, I mean, interior to this line is the epidural space and you don't want to go Further than that, um, so you'll look at your rad's tech with a menacing glare and yell, "Shot or picture or floral." I was joking. You gotta be nice. You gotta you gotta request nicely. Uh, photo, please. We are now very close to the ventral interlaminar line. At this point, I'll remove the stylet and switch to a loss of resistance syringe. I'll place my hand firmly on the patient using my thumb and index finger. I'll grab onto the hub of the needle and then remove the stylet. I'll have about two to three cc's of air in my loss of the resistance syringe, and while holding on a needle firmly, I will then screw on the loss of resistance syringe. I'll advance the needle while putting constant gentle pressure, but firm, onto the loss of resistance syringe. I'll go until I feel a sudden give. Okay, here's our orange epidural model. Um, the orange pulp is meant to represent the epidural space with the ligamentum flavum being the orange rind. Uh, the fecal sac would be anterior to this and the interlaminar space would be the space between the celery lamina. So we'll use a glass loss of resistance syringe and we'll use blue water just to illustrate uh, the injectate, quote unquote, going into the pulp of the epidural space. Notice that the most distal edge of the plunger, you'll see a sudden loss of resistance right now. And so you'll see the medication that flowed into the epidural space as well. And then um, we have a loss resistance. Now we'll check for contrast spread. So I'll inject a little bit of contrast. I don't actually have contrast with me, and plus you can't inject any into this mannequin. But I'll place my hand firmly onto the patient, and then I will grab the hub of the needle with my thumb and index finger, and then I'll inject about half a cc of contrast. You don't need much. We'll check a CLO of you now. Great, we've made it to P, puncture. Uh, we have punctured the ligamentum flavum. And so our needle tip should be just ventral to that venture, ventral interlaminar line. And our deposition of contrast should be this thick deposition, just ventral to the ventral interlaminar line. Optimal contrast flow patterns are a video in and of themselves. So I will save that for now. Our CLO view looked great, so now we'll check an AP view. All right, first things first. When you're doing any fluoroscopically guided procedures, you need orthogonal views. And that's because one view is just a two-dimensional image. So that's why we went from a CLO back to an AP to make sure we were in the right place. And in fact, when you're advancing the needle, if you are concerned with the trajectory of your needle, go back to an AP view to double check you are still going in that same trajectory view you initially started in. But when we have an optimal contrast spread on an AP view, um, since there are fat globules in the epidural space, it can kind of look airy, but and it can kind of look asymmetric on one side. Um, I can't pretend that this is going to be uh, representative of 
an optimal contrast brand, but just to give you an idea. Our AP view looked great. Now we'll inject our injectate, about five cc's worth. This can be a mixture of glucocorticoids plus saline, glucocorticoids plus local anesthetic. It just depends on who you're working with and your preference. One last view you might use is this lateral view in which you can see the image source in the lateral side and then the image intensifier of the serum on the other lateral side. You could use this in lieu of or in place of the contralateral oblique view while doing your loss of resistance technique and then checking for epidural spread. All right, last but not least, the lateral x-ray of the lumbar spine. So first we'll go over some lumbar anatomy. So we'll outline some vertebral bodies here. This is not all that lined up. That's why you see kind of the ovoid structures here. This is more lined up. So this is going to be L5, L4, right here. Five, we said it's here. S1's down here. This space right here would be the intervertebral disc space. And then moving posterior to the vertebral body, you have the pedicle right here. Coming further down, you have the inferior articular process. And then leading up to the superior articular process. And then the area between those is the pars interarticularis. Right here, this is the inferior vertebral notch. And this is the superior vertebral notch. This space in between here is going to be the intervertebral foramen or neural foramen where spinal nerves come out of. And then you can see our needle approaching here. And just to give you a view on a three-dimensional model here. You can see how the superior articular process lies right here, coming all the way down to the inferior articular process. I can just pull out right there, which articulates with the superior articular process, intervertebral disc space right here, and the neuroforamen right there. So when you look for a contrast spread in a lateral image, it should be just ventral to the spinal laminar line. So contrast would spread through here. This can sometimes be a bit more challenging to see in patients as opposed to the contralateral oblique line. This was a brief introduction on how an interlaminar epidural steroid injection is performed in the lumbar spine. I hope you found it helpful and I'll see you in the next one.